Hey everybody, Dr. A here, and in this video, we are going to be exploring a follow-up set of information from our previous video. And so in this video, we're going to be exploring how to obtain some very important consolidation properties from the void ratio versus effective stress plot. Um, and this is a plot that is generated from time deformation plots. So as a refresher, here is a void ratio versus effective stress plot. And remember, the effective stress is typically on a log scale. This region of the curve is our loading diagram. And then this little curl back up is the unloading or the rebound curve. Okay, so let's start with um, our first property that we want to figure out or estimate using one of these plots. And that's going to be called the compression index. Okay. And this is abbreviated C sub C. Now this is going to be the slope of the linear, it's really approximately linear. It's not really linear, but it's nearly linear region of the E versus sigma prime plot at the end of loading increase, okay? So what we do is we project a straight line from this point that is approximately tangent to the loading diagram, okay? So I'm gonna to try to draw this really nice for us. So you notice this red line that I just drew is approximately tangent to the end of the loading uh, diagram, the end of the, the loading part of the curve. So the slope of this is gonna be C, so that's, or C sub C. So that's C sub C uh, to one, okay? Now the way we can calculate that is because it's the slope of that line that's tangent at this point near the end of the loading portion, we can say that C sub C is equal to the change in void ratio divided by delta log effective stress. Okay, so again, it's a slope of a tangent line, so it's really just, um, it's really just, you know, rise over run, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, express this as an, maybe a value of E2 minus E1 divided by log of sigma 1, sigma prime 1, minus log of sigma prime 2. Now you may be thinking to yourself, wait a second, Dr. A, you're flip-flopping your subscripts here. Well, um, the reason why I'm doing that is when we do our actual cal consolidation calculations later on, we typically take C sub C as a positive value. Um, yes, the specimen is compressing, but if we called compression negative, then we're going to have a negative sprinkled in all of our calculations. So to make sure we have a, a numerically positive number for C sub C, you can just flip flop uh, the values associated with these these subscripts and that will factor out a negative sign. Now, one thing I want you to be careful about, the subscripts E2 and E1 are not from the first and second uh, void ratio and stress values that we talked about in our previous video. This is just meant to be two adjacent data points. So if you want to, maybe instead of E1 and E2, you could call this, you know, um, we could relabel this as E sub I plus one minus E sub I. And then in the denominator, we have log of sigma sub i minus log of sigma sub i plus one. Different textbooks may may label these subscripts differently, uh, so it depends on what you're looking at, but um, basically it's just two, two adjacent data points that would be affiliated with this straight line 
uh, tangent line or the slope of, of the loading curve, okay? So again, that's what's called the compression index. The next um, important property we're gonna learn how to calculate from this data is what's called the swell or rebound index. And that's gonna be labeled as C sub S. And this is the slope of the rebound curve on the E versus sigma prime plot. And so what we do here is uh, to get C sub S or the swell index, we look at this rebound region and we're gonna um, again go where it's approximately linear, which is gonna be about right here. We're gonna project this straight line. And we're gonna have um, a much smaller value that's gonna be C sub S and one. And again, it's, it's going to be calculated um, as, a, as a delta E over delta log effective stress uh, computation, but it's specifically affiliated with this rebound region and you're, you're uh, shooting a tangent line off from the start of the rebound region, okay? So again, um, you know, C sub S will still be in the form of delta E divided by delta log effective stress, but you gotta be careful. You're on a different part of the data curve. So you just be very careful with that. Um, in general, one thing you can always mentally check yourself on is that C sub C should always be bigger than C sub S. So this um, compression index C sub C should always be a steeper slope or a larger numerical value than the swell index C sub S. So that's always a way to kind of make sure you're, you're on the right track with things. Um, the last property we're gonna talk about computing from this particular uh, plot of data is the pre-consolidation pressure. Now, um, it was Arthur Casagrande who developed a procedure for computing the pre-consolidation pressure using this data. So Casagrande, Casa Grande in 1936 developed a graphical procedure to compute the pre-consolidation pressure which we call sometimes sigma prime C from the E sigma prime plot. And remember, we're using sigma prime on a log scale, so um, always always be mindful of that, okay? So um, what, what Casagrande said was the following, and, and I'm gonna go ahead and resketch uh, a plot of this over to the side. So we can, we can kind of um, do this together graphically. So here's a sigma prime on a log scale, and you know, here's E naught, and then here's a general, general shape right there. Okay, so uh, what, Casa, what Casa Grande said was uh, the following. Um, he said, step one, um, you need to establish establish point A on the loading curve where the radius of curvature, radius of curvature uh, is minimum. Okay, so you do this visually. So you look at, you just look at this plot and you look at the loading curve here. 
and you observe that the radius of curvature is a minimum about right here, okay? Now, how do you know that? Well, think about this. When you have a minimum radius of curvature, that means that the curve is more curvy, okay? It's more curvy. If you have a large radius of curvature, that means it's less curvy or more shallow. So um, those of you who have taken a transportation engineering or a highway engineering um, course in your civil engineering program, uh, you may be familiar with that similar type of terminology. So a minimum radius of curvature is any curve that um, is more curvy, okay? So you're looking for the part of the curve on the loading diagram that the curve is more sharp, which is going to be near uh, the upper portion of the curved um, uh, loading diagram, okay? And so once you've established that point A visually, step two is you're going to draw a horizontal line from point A just to the, to the right. So what I do is I just fire a line off to the right like this. That's my, my horizontal line, okay? Some people put another little point here and call that point B, but uh, point B is not really relevant. It's just a horizontal line you need, okay? So some, some good textbooks may have a, an extra point there, point B, but that doesn't really mean anything. It's just point A is the critical one, okay? Um, the next thing you want to do is draw, step three, draw a line tangent to point A. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, point A is here, and we're going to project a tangent line back like this, okay? And again, some textbook references give this a name, and they call that point C. But again, uh, point C is not really relevant. It's what's important is is that you just have a tangent line bouncing back from point A, okay? The next thing you do in step four is you uh, create a bisector. Let's see if I can spell correctly. Bisector to angle A. Okay, so what we do here is uh, this, this angle that we have now created where A is the vertex, you project a third line back that is what's called a bisector line, okay? Bisector. And a bisector is just a line that will cut this angle exactly in half. So for example, if we cut this in half, you know, this angle, let's call it theta, would be equal to this angle, which is also theta. So if you remember from geometry knowledge, you were just cutting that angle A in half, okay? Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna project a uh, straight line, um, a straight line portion that you can call whatever you want. Um, some references give it more letters, but it's a straight line portion of the loading curve here back to where it intersects this bisector. So I'm gonna change colors here and I'm gonna go with maybe purple. I'm gonna project a straight line version of the loading curve back here and I'm gonna note the point where it intersects the bisector, okay? So I'm gonna say step five, project a straight line back from the load curve to intersect the bisector that we just drew. And notice that I, I noted that little point where it hits that bisector. And then what you do is you fire a line straight down. What color do we wanna go with now? Let's do blue. We're gonna fire a line straight down to the horizontal axis from that point, okay? So step six is project a vertical line 
down to the sigma prime axis from the point in step five, okay? And um, in math, we sometimes call this value where it intersects the sigma prime axis the abscissa, okay? And this value right here is your pre-consolidation pressure, okay? So I'm putting a little point here. That right there is your pre-consolidation pressure that we were looking for. Now, if you remember what is pre-consolidation pressure, that's the maximum uh, past pressure that an over-consolidated soil uh, would have ever experienced, okay? So that's your pre-consolidation pressure right here using Casa Grande's method. So this is how we determine some important uh, consolidation properties from this data. Now, if you are missing laboratory data, there are several empirical relations that we can use or apply to compute um, these values. So I'm just going to make a little note of that. Um, I'm going to say in the absence of lab data, there are several empirical relations we could use to estimate C sub C and C sub S. I'm not really gonna get into these in, in um, this particular video, but you can read about those on your own. Um, most of these are connected to Atterberg limits. So for example, if you did not run a consolidation test and you don't have this consolidation lab data, but you do have the Atterberg limits, you can apply uh, some empirical relations, maybe by Skimpton or uh, Maine and Cole Howie to determine C sub C and C sub S. You can read about those on your own um, in a reference material, uh, because again, this video was really meant to illustrate the graphical determination of these important properties. So if you found um, this video helpful to you, please hit like and subscribe, and we'll see you again in our follow-up videos. Thanks for watching.